Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to World of Tanks Frontline, currently running on the Sandbox server. Brand new game mode, coming, well I hesitate to use the word soon, it's on the Sandbox server, which, you know, not the test server, which means that it's probably coming, well, not soon. But judging on how it plays, I definitely think this is coming, in one form or another, to World of Tanks. Frontlines is a brand new 30 versus 30 game mode in World of Tanks. At the moment, on the Sandbox server, it's confined to Tier 10 vehicles and Tier 8 light tanks only. Although there are plans, once the Tier 10 light tanks have made it onto the Sandbox server, to include them in Frontlines as well. How the hell are you going to be able to fit 60 players into one World of Tanks map? Well, this ain't like any map you've ever seen in World of Tanks. This is currently the only map available on the Sandbox server for testing Frontlines. It's called Epic Normandy. As you can quite plainly see, it's based on the Normandy map that we already have in World of Tanks. Except it's nine times bigger. <laughs> this is a nine square kilometer map. Any one of the squares on this map is as big as any existing map in World of Tanks. Frontline is a game of attack and defence. Each of the map grids in the three southernmost map squares contains a capture point, as well as a bunch of repair points, and more on those in a moment. Successfully taking one of those capture points, and right here you can see the three southernmost capture points in the three southernmost map grids, Alpha, Bravo and Charlie. And if the attacking team manages to successfully take one of those capture points, that then claims that particular map grid for the attacking team, and it unlocks access to the next capture point to the north. So what you're seeing here is the attacking team trying and failing to take the initial capture point to the north of their starting point. This is Alpha. You can see Bravo and Charlie further over there to the east. Now if they do take Alpha, a number of options become available. They can sit and hold onto it and attempt to assist the rest of the team in capturing Bravo and Charlie further over to the east, or they can push on the map grid immediately to the north because that will then become available for capture in Delta, in one of the three central map grids. The defending team likewise have two options. They can counter-attack and take Alpha back to keep the attacking team on the back foot, or they can concede the loss fall back and begin the defence of the next map grid to the north. A word about the mini-map, by the way. It wouldn't really be possible. Well, it would be possible to show the entire map of this epic Normandy Frontlines map on the mini-map, but the scale would be so large that it would just wouldn't be useful. You wouldn't be able to make out any of the detail. And so the mini-map that you're looking at down there in the bottom right corner of the screen is actually only really showing you about a fifth of the battlefield. Obviously it's centred around your tank, so it shows you the most relevant information. But there's another key that you're going to have to start getting used to when you're playing Frontlines, and that's the M key. That actually brings up the map of the whole battlefield to give you a better idea of what's going on anywhere that isn't immediately around you. Although, to be completely honest, at least if my personal experience so far of playing in Frontlines is any indication, uh, you're probably going to have your hands just a little bit too full with what is going on immediately around you to give too much care and thought to what's happening to somebody else and your team three kilometres away. Now, a quick word on those repair points, because we've seen repair points in other non-standard game modes that Wargaming have introduced over the years, and they pretty much work... Well, if you've seen a repair point in a game of World of Tanks before, they work in pretty much exactly the same way. If your tank takes damage, you can drive into one of the repair points and within a short period of time your tank will be fully repaired, providing of course you're not actually getting shot at. Now, in the three starting map grids, Alpha, Bravo and Charlie, there is a repair point to the south for the attacking team and a repair point to the north for the defending team. And yes, this is the defending team and they are in the southernmost attacking team's repair point. <laughs> this attacking team never even managed to get off the beach. Uh, let alone capture any of the capture points. Now what happens when you drive into these repair points is that your tank begins the process of refilling its health bar. It doesn't happen immediately, it does take a couple of seconds. And once that process is complete, it then incurs a cooldown. So you can't just sit there indefinitely, constantly repairing all the damage that you're taking, like that guy was trying to do. It doesn't work like that. In order to actually take advantage of the repair point, you can't be getting shot at because taking damage resets the cooldown. 
you have to be within the confines of the border of the repair circle and nobody else can be using it at the same time. Once you're fully repaired, you'll see that there's a cooldown, a minute and a half, before I can use that repair point again. The repair points also have the added perk in that they resupply your ammunition because there were concerns from, let's face it, batch hat drivers who, if they're having a good game, can run out of ammunition in a 15 versus 15 game, let alone a 30 versus 30, and would be facing the very real possibility that if they were playing front lines without some way of replenishing their ammunition, they would just run out of ammo very early on in the game, if they were doing well. That's not an issue. If you do find yourself running low on ammunition, just head to the nearest repair point and it will replenish your ammunition stocks. So that's great news for machines that don't traditionally carry an awful lot of ammunition into the game. The FD215B, for example, the batch out, like we've already mentioned, certain other of the artillery pieces. So what happens in front lines when the inevitable occurs, because you're not quickie baby or circumflexes, and at some point you get your vehicle blown out from underneath you? Do not despair. Just pick another one. There's a short cooldown before you can redeploy into battle. The game gives you 30 seconds. Use it wisely. Have a look at the map. Have a look at the situation. Do you need more heavy tanks in the defence? Do you need more medium tanks to outflank? Do you need more light tanks to actually spot the enemy so the rest of your team can kill them? Take a look at the map. Analyse the situation. Pick the tank best suited for what it is you want to do next. And then, based on which zones your team actually control, deploy. And now for a word about playing artillery in front lines. See, unlike in a random battle in World of Tanks of 15 versus 15 on at most a one square kilometre map. Artillery and front lines cannot sit at their spawn point, if they're on the attacking team at least, in one of the first three southernmost starting grids and still hit enemy vehicles on the other side of the map. These are bigger maps. They're three kilometres by three kilometres, so nine square kilometres. They just don't have the range. Even tier 10 artillery doesn't have the range to fire all the way across to the other side of the map. So artillery is going to have to move at some point if you're on the attacking team and your team are actually managing to capture and push on past the objectives. At some point you're going to have to move forward otherwise you're just going to run out of things to shoot at. So how do you actually win a game of frontline? Well it's all down to the attacking team. The attacking team ultimately have a bunch of objectives that they must destroy. Let's take a closer look at the map here. At this point, my team are actually doing quite well. We control four of the six available capture points, and we're in the process of capturing a fifth, with the defending team stubbornly holding on to Foxtrot there, over on the far middle eastern end of the map. But what's happened now is that the actual game objectives have now become available because we've captured one of those central capture points. Now we're in a position to actually start attacking the real objective here, and it's not the capture points in the two southernmost rows of the map. It's those objectives indicated by the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. These are what the attacking team actually has to destroy in order to win the game and all the defending team has to do in order to win the game is make sure at least one of them survives by the time the game timer runs out. And you might be sitting here thinking, well, easy. Once they become available everybody just jumps into artillery. Uh, yeah, not so much. Artillery cannot damage these things. It has to be done by tanks. There are five of them. They're pretty big targets. You can't really miss them, but they do all have 4,000 health. And let's not forget, at this stage of the game, the enemy team are going to be defending them quite ferociously. However, the defending team are hampered by the fact that if you have a look at the map, once again, we're going to take a look at the map and have a look at where these repair and resupply points are. It's actually quite clever. Initially, when the attacking team is struggling to get off the beach and capture A, B and C, they're aided because they have a repair point to the south of the capture points, and the defending team also have a repair point to the north of the capture points. But then as the battle moves further north, assuming the attacking team can even get off the beach, which is by no means guaranteed, you'll note that in the next three northernmost map grids, the repair points are all on the northern side of the cap circles, so it's going to favour the defenders. Now that doesn't mean that the attacking team don't have anywhere to repair, they can capture the zone and use the repair point to the north of the capture point, or they can repair further south, back in the northernmost repair point of the zone that they've just captured. But once the battle gets down to the vinegar strokes and they're actually fighting to destroy and defend 
the five numbered objectives in the three northernmost map grids, the only available repair points are all behind the attacking team. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, if that's the case, how the hell are the defending teams supposed to win? Well, you'd be surprised. Believe it or not, we still did actually manage to lose this. The team put up a good fight, but we just took too long. We controlled five of the six available capture positions, but by the time the map timer had expired and the game ended, we'd only taken out one of those gun positions, and so the defending team won. So what do I think of front lines? I, I like it. And I'll explain why. But first, I think it's important to get something out of the way that I didn't like about Frontlines right at the start. And it's the old corridor map meta rearing its ugly head again. As we're doing this flyover of the A, B and C map grids down in the far southern end of the map, where the initial phase of the battle is going to take place. Are you seeing the corridors? Because I'm seeing the corridors. And that really kind of pissed me off. Because that's just what we need in World Attacks, isn't it? A nine square kilometre corridor map, as if we don't have enough of those already on a one square kilometre or less scale. And that really did piss me off, because I had high hopes for front lines, as the game mode, finally, where light tanks could stretch their legs, misbehave, get out there, and see what sort of trouble they could get themselves into. And initially, at least, as you're fighting to get off the beaches, that's going to be difficult, um, because the first three map grids are corridor maps. I took a T-54 lightweight out in an attempt to break through the lines, get around behind the enemy and see what kind of misbehaving I could get up to. And it just wasn't possible, because they're corridor maps. You can't fight your way through them because you're in a light tank and there's an E-100 at the other end of the corridor with a Gorilla 15 camped in the bushes behind him. You can't slip through because they're corridor maps, and they'll see you coming. And that was very, very disappointing. At least at first, because as the game progressed, and your team does actually manage to fight its way off those beaches, and get at least one of those initial capture points under their control, and you push further north, suddenly the map opens right up. Once you get in land into the centre of the map, suddenly there are wide open spaces. Loads of room for light tanks and medium tanks as well to get out there and misbehave. So while initially, when you're in the southernmost map grids and you're struggling to battle your way off the beaches, I was definitely consumed by a feeling of, for God's sake, wargaming, how did you manage to screw this up? But once you do manage to fight your way off those beaches and you make it into the middle of the map, suddenly the shoe's on the other foot. Suddenly, you don't have to fight those heavies head-on because you're not facing them at the wrong end of the corridor map anymore. Lots of wide open ground, the medium tanks can get to work out flanking, the light tanks can get out there spotting. Artillery players suddenly find a use for their W key because if you're fighting this far north, artillery, who are still camped on the beaches, you're now outside of their effective fire support range. And just to illustrate the point, the Object 261, which can fire from the bottom corner of Himmelsdorf and hit you on the top right corner of Redshire, and well, it can't do that on front lines. You can see here that I've just reached the maximum effective range of the Object 261's gun, which isn't something that you're ever likely to see in a regular game of World of Tanks, 1,471 metres. Which means that from this position, I can hit anything about as far away as that, and no further. So, my initial concerns about Frontline, that it was just one big 9 square kilometre corridor map, were unfounded. That is definitely the case initially, but once you break out of those beaches, the three separate elements of your team are able to link up, and there's loads of open ground in the centre of the map for those medium tank wolf packs to get together and make life really, really difficult for the heavy tank players. My one remaining concern with Frontlines is how expensive, at the moment, it is to actually play. And what I mean by that is the repair and ammunition costs. You see, the way it works is that, at the moment, it's Tier 10 tanks and Tier 8 light tanks, and then once the Tier 10 light tanks become available, it'll be Tier 10 tanks only. And what happens in-game is if you get a tank knocked out, you have to sit around waiting for 30 seconds, and then you can pick any other Tier 10 tank and take that into battle. And you can keep doing that until you run out of Tier 10 tanks, if you're bad enough. And that's the thing. It's difficult enough to run a profit when you're playing a regular 15 versus 15 random battle at tier 10 in World of Tanks, when you just lose one tank. 
But if you have to pay for the repairs of five <laughs> tier 10 tanks and their ammunition costs, this can be a very, very expensive game mode to play. The first game I played, I came out of it down 42,000 credits. The second game I played, I did a bit better, but I still came out of it down 37,000 credits. So the economy probably needs to be addressed. Otherwise, it's just going to be too expensive for people to play. Uh, having said that, I think the economy is probably the last thing on Wargaming's list of things to get right about Frontlines at the moment. Uh, first, make sure the game mode is balanced and it works and there are no obvious gameplay mechanic issues and then they really do need to take a look at the economy. But other than that, I think this is a really, really good game mode. It's a lot of fun. I've had fun playing it and I can't wait for it to happen on the live server so you guys can have fun playing it too. So, World of Tanks Frontlines. There it is. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. And as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.